You may remain seated. By way of introduction, our Lenten theme this year is the passion as I remember it. It's kind of a different approach. Uh, the idea is to do first person preaching. So each of the pastors has a character from the biblical record and they look at the text assigned, uh, connected with that character, and present the text as if they were that person. Um, the concept is you are supposed to imagine that you are a first century Christian audience hearing this person speak uh, and talk about what they remember from that night. As such, it is important to note that some things are going to be conjecture, how the character is feeling, what he is thinking that the text doesn't say. However, everything that is being driven at, everything, all the points that are being made are drawn from the text and uh, Everything that is said about Jesus, as well, is drawn only from the text of Scripture. Our text this evening is from John 18, 1 through 11. When he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. On the other side there was an olive grove, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place, because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the grove, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. And Judas the traitor was standing there with him. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Who is it that you want? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. I told you that I am he, Jesus answered. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not last one of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? So far God's holy word, we pray. Lord, sanctify us through your truth. Your word is truth. Amen. I was just doing my duty. Only a servant after all. But that night, I remember it so well. It was the night I met him, the night I met Jesus. Now I had known something was going on. Everybody was astir. Everybody was talking. Malchus, the chief priest who was my master, he was intent and urgent. Jesus of Nazareth, that rabbi, he had been the topic, conversational mainstay in the household for quite some time, and I knew that Malchus hated him. And from what I'd heard, so did the rest of the Sanhedrin. But I didn't quite understand. Why didn't they just arrest him, anyway, if he was so bad? Was it the crowds? I suppose it must have been. Jerusalem was overflowing with people, and Jesus was the word on everyone's tongue. He was popular. Too popular, it would seem. We couldn't just arrest him in the temple. I mean, who knew what the crowds would do? And then Judas had come and offered to betray Jesus to us, one of his own special disciples. He said he knew right where Jesus would be, a special place, a private place, that he always used to take his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane. And I was a little bit skeptical about going to arrest him there. It just seemed too obvious. I mean, wouldn't Jesus know that we were going to try to arrest him? Judas even seemed to imply that Jesus had known he was going out to betray him. What were we going to find there? What were we getting ourselves into? I was just a servant after all, just doing my duty. I didn't want any trouble. So I was relieved when I saw how many soldiers we were bringing. A whole Roman cohort. At least 300 soldiers, maybe, maybe hundreds more. It's hard to tell. Couldn't even count them. But then I started wondering why we were bringing so many. It seemed like an unnecessary abundance. What did they think this man was capable of? I had heard some of the stories, but it didn't seem like it could really be true. I started to worry. The soldiers, the troops, were nervous, eerily silent as they crossed the Kidron. I think they were wondering the same thing I was. What were we going to find in that garden? The tension between Jesus and the scribes and Pharisees had been building and building and building, and he had to know something was up. He wasn't just going to give up without a fight, was he? What was I getting myself into? And then we were there, and then he was there. 
bathed in the light of a full moon. I remember it vividly because it was the time of Passover. Then he stepped forward calmly. He seemed like he was in a great deal of pain and yet resolute, determined, even kind. And he said, whom are you seeking? Some of us in front near Judas said, Jesus the Nazarene. To my dying breath, I could never forget what happened next. Jesus spoke just two words. I am. Now, any Hebrew knew what was behind those words. It was the name of God. Jehovah. I am who I am. And when Jesus said that, we all drew back, breathless. And then the whole huge crowd, soldiers and servants and all, we fell to the ground. We couldn't help it. Because there was such power in his words. I started to think that hundreds of soldiers wasn't nearly enough. Slowly, we got back to our feet. And Jesus again asked, whom are you seeking? Somehow, we managed to have the nerve to say again, Jesus the Nazarene. And again, Jesus said, I am. And the rest of his response floored me even more than the first one had. He said, if you are seeking me, then let these men go. He had just demonstrated such power. Clearly, he could have brought our plans to nothing very easily, and yet he surrenders, delivers himself over to us. He asks only that we let his disciples go. What kind of a man was this? What kind of love? What kind of friendship? I didn't know if the priest had wanted us to arrest his disciples or not, but we certainly weren't going to do that now. Jesus' point was clear. Take me and I'll come along like a meek little lamb. Go after my disciples and you'll get the lion. He was so protective of them. They weren't just his students. He treated them like friends, like brothers, like children. While I was still in shock, amazed at his power and at his kindness, one of his disciples, I came to know him later as Peter, stepped forward brashly, one man against hundreds. And before I knew it, his sword was slashing towards me in the air. I tried to dodge, but I felt a searing pain in the side of my head. Reaching up, my hand came back bloody. And I saw an ear lying on the ground. Was that my ear? I looked at Peter in, in fear and in anger, and I saw my own emotions reflected on his face. I had been afraid that something like this was going to happen. I couldn't even bring myself to think of the horror of it. The rest of my life, without my ear, I would be deformed. I would be not nearly as valuable to my master. It wasn't fair. Why did this have to happen to me? I was just a servant, just doing my duty. And then Jesus turned to Peter, eyes stern, voice unyielding. Put that away. Shall I not drink the cup my father has given me to drink? That phrase from Jesus, which I had heard just with one ear before, soon seemed to resound in both as Jesus stepped forward, looked at me with those eyes, sad, ancient eyes, and touched my head. Suddenly the searing pain was gone, and those words echoed, shall I not drink the cup my Father has given me to drink? See, there was the answer to the questions that had been building in my mind all night long. What kind of a man would we need to bring a small army to arrest? What kind of a man would come there even when he knew that we were going to come to arrest him? What kind of a man would give himself to us when clearly no army would be sufficient to arrest him? What kind of love was this? And why would he care for me that he would heal my ear? Why would he, the lion, go like a lamb to the slaughter? Shall I not drink the cup my father has given me to drink? See, I came to realize that Jesus was a servant too. He was just doing his duty. Not that he was the servant of the Father, he was the son of the Father, and his will, perfectly aligned with the Father's will, was to come and make himself the servant of all mankind. And the next day, he showed what that meant. He gave his blood for them all so that these might go free. He, as a lamb on the cross, roared in the face of a much greater force, a much more powerful enemy, saying to sin and death and hell and Satan, these are mine. I am paying for them. 
I am dying for them. I am forgiving them. You can take me, but let these go free. It was ironic, really. We'd been sent there in order to take this man to the cross so that people would stop believing in him. We've been sent there to put an end to this crazy idea that Jesus was the Messiah, and yet perhaps nowhere did Jesus show so clearly that he was exactly who he said he was. Son of God, Savior in Christ. And there and that night, and in the things he said, and in the things that he did the next day, he made a believer out of me. Now you might be wondering how I could say that. John doesn't specifically say in his gospel that I was brought to faith, and I'm never mentioned again in the rest of the Bible after the gospel accounts. And yet, you do know my name. It's Malchus. And I think that's really important. See, John doesn't give a lot of names in his gospel. He only named seven of the apostles. He didn't give the name of the woman at the well in Samaria, and he didn't give the name of the man who was born blind and healed by Jesus. They had whole chapters devoted to them, but, but no name. And yet the Holy Spirit decides to record mine. Very specifically, his name was Malchus. It says, why? I think it's because that night, even though I was just a servant, just doing my duty, my duty brought me face to face with Jesus Christ. I think it's because Jesus saved me. He gave me faith. He did his duty. That was his duty, and he has done all things well. So that now I serve a different master. The only one worth serving. Come, step into that moon-bathed night with me and see this master, see this Jesus. See the burden he was bearing. See his power and his care, his compassion. See his service. This is the one I want to serve, who served me first. Even though I was a sinner, even though I had come there to arrest him and bring him to the cross. It doesn't matter that I was just doing my duty. It wasn't just my duty that brought him to the cross. It was also my sins. That's why he was there. My sins and yours. And yet, he willingly paid the price for us all. Even though we were sinners. That's the master I want to follow. He's the only one worth serving.